Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we're in our house, the Pierce family house, and uh, we're doing our little service here. So uh, Leah has some things and some greetings to say, and uh, then I'll share a message after that. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, here we are again at home in our house. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit different, but kind of getting used to it as well. And so I've been thinking about this morning about the service and in prayer. And as I was in prayer, uh, a couple of things came to me. So I'm going to share with you again this week, uh, Pastor Leah Nugget. So as I was praying this morning, I felt the Lord stir in me. Um, what do you value? What do you appreciate? So I went and had a look at that word value. And it means something that is held um, of importance, of worth. Something that is youthful. Something that has merit. And it also, um, and then the word appreciate, it means recognise the full worth of. To be grateful for. So something that is of importance and worth, something that is useful, that's what value means, and appreciate means recognise the full worth of. And I felt like the Lord was saying to me uh, with those words is in this time and in this season that is a, a different season, it's something that we probably didn't look ahead into 2020 and think was going to happen. Out of this season, what are you valuing? What are you appreciating? And when I thought about that, I thought, well, first and foremost, I value and appreciate you, Lord. And I value and appreciate having the knowledge of you in my life and having relationship with you. And then the next thing I thought about is I've been thinking and valuing and appreciating more friendships, family, relationship. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, I read a couple of things this week that kind of stirred me up in this area as well from friends. Uh, what one friend said is, um, we've learned from this what's important and what's not important. The most important things in life are not money and things, but they are people, family and friends. That's true, isn't it? Then I also um, read this. I think when the dust settles, we will realise how very little we need, how much we actually have, and the true value of human connection. And that human connection is talking about our relationship. And then that made me this morning, as I was thinking about that, I thought about how God created us. He created us to have a relationship with, to have, um, he wanted a family. And so he created us for that, for relationship. And he didn't uh, create us and then say, have dominion and then just where you go and leave us to it. No, the scripture says that, you know, he always wanted to be involved because in the cool of the evening, he would come down and he would fellowship with man. You know, when God created us, as I said, it wasn't to just leave us here, go do your own thing, have a nice life. No, he wanted to be still involved. He wanted to fellowship with us. He wanted to have relationship with us. And uh, then he discovered it wasn't good for man to be alone. And so he created woman. He created Eve so that they, they could have relationship and have fellowship with each other. And I suppose that also made me think of, um, we're hearing the experts say that when people are locked away, particularly those that are by themselves, that it's not good for their mental health. Why? Because God created us for fellowship, to have relationship. And uh, turn the page here. 
And I thought about that and I thought about everything that's going on. And as I said last week, it's like all the distractions, all the things that um, maybe we have in our lives, they're being stripped away. And um, stripped away so that we can um, maybe spend time at the feet of the Father and in His presence. And also stripped away so maybe we can reevaluate things in our life and reprioritize, as Pastor David said last week, maybe reset, you know, look at our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, for us being in ministry, quite often we can be busy uh, doing the Father's work, you know, running off to a prayer meeting here or, um, you know, going to this, doing this, doing that. And it's all necessary and it's all good. But, you know, sometimes even if I'm going to sit down and watch some kind of a teaching, I'll feel that gentle tug in my spirit where the Lord will say, that's great, but I want you to spend time with me. Why? He, he desires relationship. He desires fellowship. And uh, quite often he'll say to me, you know, I want you to be still and know that I am God. He wants to strip away all the cares, all the things of this world and just wants us to get quiet and uh, spend time with him in his presence. And, um, you know, I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, how we can get so busy about doing the things and the Lord reminded me of the scripture in Matthew 7, verse 22, that says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, I find that scripture quite sad, that he is people going out and doing things, but the Lord's saying, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's telling me that there's that lack of relationship. There's that lack of intimacy there. So, wrapping it up. Pastor Leah's nugget. I'm thinking, let's keep it simple and not let the demands and the desires and the lusts in this life overtake us. You know, during this time, let's take a breath Let's reevaluate our life and what the priorities in our life. Let's appreciate and value um, our relationships, our connection with God and each other. Let's just take the time to take a breath, reprioritize, revalue those things that really are important to us in our life and let's make this time that we have of being separated let's make it count so that when we come out of it we have that resolve and we go on and we make each day count so that's pastor leah's nugget for today god bless you all bye <laughs> that's a lovely nugget thank you darling so I'm getting used to doing this uh, second time. <laughs> yes, I don't know how to do this. It's okay. That makes two of us. But uh, this technology is not even new at all. YouTube's. Uh, we may have to go to live church and uh, live webinars and all things like that where we can chat and communicate back and forth. That technology is there. But let's just take this time to uh, be separated. And you may be separated with just a one or two people. Some of you are separated alone. Um, don't waste this time of grieving. Use it. You know, this time will pass and then you will have uh, a different life. And uh, you can use this time wisely and uh, build a relationship with God in a special, unique piece of time. You know, every moment of every day will never occur again. This is the first day of the rest of your life. You know, yesterday is gone. Today, this moment is gone. This moment 
It's now gone. See? Time waits for nobody. God created time. He created us from the eternal realm and created a natural physical realm in the time dimension, space dimension. And this is where we live in the flesh. We're a spiritual being. We live in the supernatural realm at the same time. We have the soul in the middle. You know, we're a spiritual being created in the image and likeness of God. And we are to live as spiritual beings in this natural realm. But this natural realm has fallen. And it's fallen from its original glory. But Jesus came to restore us back to the Father so that we can partake of that glory, walk in the spiritual realm while we're living in this natural realm. But the soul, the thoughts, the intellects have to be changed. You have to be transformed. I talking last week about the Old Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Testament. God has a New Testament built on better promises. You know, we just uh, glimpsed a little bit of that last week. We may look a little more this week or in the weeks to come. But there is a New Testament, a New Covenant. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the same Jesus as he was in time past. But now he has flesh he has a physical body. He is the God-man. He is the Christ of old, the God of ages. But He is the living Creator. He is Jesus Christ come in the flesh. You know, died for sinner's death. Died as a cursed object without it, never sinning. So that He could be raised in glory and be the righteous one for eternity. His blood is on that mercy seat as alive as it was the day He shed His blood for us, for the remission of our sin. In the Old Testament, sins were atoned for, which means they were covered over. And just for uh, time until the priest could go and make a sacrifice on behalf, you know, for the people before God, standing in the breach. But now Jesus stands in the breach continually, eternally, uh, consistently, and his blood doesn't cover sins. It obliterates them. Um, it remits yeah. sins. It Thank forgives sins. To forgive and remove those sins as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? It just never stops. God is the eternal God. When He forgives, He does it perfectly through the blood of His Son. And He lifts us up into His presence as if we've never sinned. That's good news. Amen. Amen. I'm preaching to my audience. There's my uh, <laughs> church family over there. There's my wife. But I know God the Father is here with us. The Father is with us. He's in us. Jesus is here. As His Word says, if two or more gathered in His name, He's there in the midst. And the Holy Spirit, He's obviously here. He's in me. He's in you. If you know Jesus, if you don't. Get Jesus in your heart, get Jesus in your life. He'll come in just like he said he would and you'll never be alone again. You know, you can be alone in your home, but you're not alone in your heart. God is there and he'll even set his angels and the great cloud of witnesses. Saints of God will be looking in and they can even come and visit with you as God permits. We're not getting into spooky new age stuff. Some think, oh, you're standing new age, you pastor. No, new age is sounding like the church. Satan didn't invent anything. God is the God of the universe. God is the creator of all. Not Satan, not New Age, not witches. They just ride in in the natural realm and the soul realm. Remember, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament is in the realm of the flesh, the realm of the natural, the realm of the soul, or the intellect. The New Testament is from the realm of the heart, from the realm of the spirit. We're to live from a spirit man. and We'll make decisions through our intellect by the spirit of God that's within us. You know, But we have to get this soul realm transformed. We have to get this mind renewed so that we can... Um, discern what is true, what is just, what is right, and make quality decisions from our heart. See, we're never meant to live by our intellect and by our wit anymore. We're to live by the Spirit of God, by the presence of God within us as children of God. You know, if God was to make a son or a daughter, do you think he would make them like himself? I know you're saying, yes, of course he would. Well, that's what he's done when he made sons and daughters. Jesus is in God's likeness, and we are second born, third born, fourth, fifth, millionth, whatever it is, we're born of the Spirit of God. God don't make no trash. He don't make no junk. Yeah. He makes only perfection. He makes sons and daughters. And this is good news. You know, if we're thinking, oh, I don't know about this good news. God's never done nothing for me. If you've asked Jesus to come in your heart, and if he's come in, he's done more for you than you ever realize. You should be thanking him throughout eternity and not whinging and gropping and complaining like the rest of the world. You know, we've been transformed and minds have to catch up. We need to have them renewed and restored. We need the mind of Christ formed within our brains. We've been given the mind of Christ. Now it has to come up. Where? From out there somewhere? No, from the inside where the Spirit of God is. When we feed that Word of God through our eye gates, through our ear gates, speak it out, let it go down, let it come on up. It's the living Word that comes up. We are to be living letters, living epistles, read by all people. 
that Word of God can live on the inside and transform our thinking. We are to live from the inside out. The animals are clothed from the outside. They live from the outside realm. They're just beasts. We're not to live like animals anymore. You know, when man sinned, he became uh, animal nature. We have spiritual nature, the DNA of God. We're to live from the inside where the Spirit of God dwells, where the new creature, the new creation dwells. You know, the Bible says, if anyone's in Christ, who isn't anyone? That's got to be all you're listening. You know, if you're not in Christ, you can get in Christ. Just come to Jesus, you know. Come to Jesus Christ, Christ anointed. Come to the Messiah, the anointed one. Get Christ on the inside. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature, new creation. Mm -hmm. Means that's a new species. Never existed before. So you're just not a species. You're one of a kind. You're one in that species of sons and daughters. Unique. None else like you. You're a new species, a new species of being that never existed before that moment. At the moment of your conception, when that seed came in, that sperm of God came in, you became a new creature, formed and fashioned by the hand of Creator God. You know, sure your parents had a job to do. Yes, they do what they do to make babies. But God breathed the life of God into you when you become born again. Hallelujah. Uh, this is good news. So you're just not a flesh ball. You're just not someone that can be taken from the womb at will because, you know, someone has a choice to have their baby or not. No, it's, it's, you, you get the privilege to bring a baby into the world, but the baby really belongs to God. We're just there taking care of it. We're caretakers. We help with the flesh part, but God breathes the eternal spirit in. When that baby dies, if, you know, if that child grows up and dies or dies young, that spirit goes back to God and that body one day will be resurrected. But, you know, there's coming a generation, this may very well be it, where even we'll defeat death itself. Yes, you heard me right, where this flesh will put on mortality, immortality, and we'll be just like Jesus Christ, hallelujah, and never die. But all those in heaven are waiting for that adoption of their body. Uh, some have got it, like, you know, have already got it. Won't get into all that right now. Jesus has it, and uh, but most haven't, and we'll all get it. And that body will be glorious, never capable of sin again. We'll live in everlasting righteousness and we'll glow like the stars uh, in the heavens. When I was waiting on God this morning, I got some uh, uh, you know, words that I'd like to share with you. And, you know, they're, they're my words, but they're from my heart, which means that, um, you know, they're more... When you get things from your heart, it's more pure than from your, from your uh, brain. You know, this brain needs transforming, needs renewing. We'll talk about that soon when we go to Romans 12. But when you have your heart of hearts and it makes uh, contact with the Spirit of God, it comes out in a way that's uh, with your nature, with God's nature attached to it, with your personality in it, but it comes with truth. And many times when I share things this way and I write them down, you'll feel the truth of it come through. And this is what will uh, take place of all servants of God when they hear the Spirit of God speaking to their heart and they translate it through into their own language. It comes with an anointing on it. It comes with that power on it. Um, so I just wrote some things down this morning. As we know, things are about to change. I shared that last week. Pastor Lee's been sharing that even this morning. Uh, things won't remain as they are. And I've been sharing that for years. And you may think, well, okay, some things have really started changing now. They've been changing, you know, since we've been in uh, the kingdom. But there's a uh, increase, a shift things are starting to change fast because we're coming into a new era, a new age, into the kingdom age. You may realize that some change has occurred already and that changes have already started taking place. The future of the church life will be different than it was in the past. We must prepare for this. We must be willing to change and to be changed. Or as the scriptures declare, to be metamorphosized or to be changed Completely, you know, like a, a grub turning into a moth or butterfly. That's a metamorphosis. The grub changes into a soupy mixture inside that little chrysalis in that cocoon, and then a miracle takes place. You know, a new creature is formed, breaks out, flies away, a new life. This is metamorphosis or a complete change. This is what God does in the hearts of His children. And this is what's changing continually, continual metamorphosis. In the born-again spirit, there already has been a metamorphosis. But in the soul or mental realm, the metamorphosis has already begun and will continue throughout eternity. As we bring our will 
and our emotions in line with God's will, His thoughts, His purposes, His plans, the change will continue. For some, not much has changed in their soul realm because they have compromised and not gone after God in the correct manner, or if at all. Or some have gone after uh, God incorrectly, even though maybe uh, sincerely, but have been corrupted by false teaching or false teachers, and the waters are muddied or made impure. Or they have been corrupted through sin, through compromise, and have tried to love God and love the world simultaneously, which is impossible. You must choose who you love and where your true allegiance is. You cannot have two lovers. You must love God first and love Him above all. You must love people, period. You know, there's no choice. We can choose not to, but, you know, it's not going to be good. We must love. Or we too will be corrupted, false, and will be a mixture. You must choose where your true heart allegiance is. If you don't, your heart will wander. You must choose this day who you will serve and you will, who you will love the most and where your true heart devotion lies. This is a serious hour. This is a time of sifting, testing, trial, to see where you really are. Where and to whom is your loyalty and to where is your love? Where is your heart? The very core, where is your devotion? You cannot pretend at this, for you are who you are. The time of pretending, or the time of hypocrisy, is coming to an end. All is beginning to be revealed. The truth is beginning to be revealed. The true and false followers of the living God will start to be revealed more continue to be made known to all in due time. We must repent. Repent is a change of heart, change of mind, change of attitude. You know, that's the first message Jesus ministered. You know, to repent. In uh, the Acts, where the apostles of the Lord are ministered, repent. John the Baptist, you know, greatest, uh, a prophet of the old covenant, his message was one of repentance. Change of heart, change of mind, change of attitude. That God is not a condemner. He is a blesser. He blesses and lifts up. Repent is not a condemning message. Repent is a liberating, freeing message. To repent means you're going to change and get your thoughts and your actions aligned up with God so that His blessing, so that His power can manifest and flow through you freely. For your benefit of yourself, for your family, for your home, for your friends, for your nation. As far as you can believe, but uh, you have to be aligned uh, with the Lord so He can manifest and flow through. So uh, we must repent. And this brings me to uh, Romans chapter 12, if we can, um, if you want to read the Bible or just sit there and watch and listen. But I'm going to read from two translations. I'll read from New Living. And then I will uh, read from the, the Passion translation. I'm getting right into this Passion translation these days. I like it, but I still, you know, the New King James is where I sort of cut my teeth. And it's, it's more um, yeah, fluent but, um, and easy to memorize. But these other translations break it down. The Amplified Classic is uh, brilliant. But uh, we're reading from New Living uh, Translation and from the, uh, the message, uh, the Passion, excuse me. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy, copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I don't know if you can hear a little happy family outside there. We've got birds. Uh, my wife, Leah, she said, oh, you should close that because you know, that would be good. And I'm glad I did now because they're out there squatting. <laughs> I love them. You know, we have a window open here and a beautiful tree. And there's they birds the there. Mate. They're helpmates, you know. We've got the bird there. <laughs> flat, flat, featherless. And we've got feathered birds outside. <laughs> so the Passion says, we'll just, what we'll do is we'll just read verse 2 from the Passion. That's Romans 12, 2. 
Don't you love the name passion? If you're going to do something, put a bit of passion into it. You know, lazy people are passionate at doing what? Uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing, you know. Well, I'm just, I'm not interested. But they're passionate. Let's be passionate about doing something good, about doing something righteous, about doing God's will. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. Hallelujah. Amen. Is it good? Yep. See, I can only listen to one congregation member today because you're out there amening on the other end. So as I was saying last week, we are uh, now living under a new covenant of God living within us, living with us, God on the outside, dealing with the flesh and soul realm. Uh, that was the Old Testament, but the new covenant is God on the inside. Say inside. inside. On the inside, dealing with our spirit or hidden person of the heart. Where he deals with our thoughts, intentions, attitudes, and gets right on down in there. He wants us to totally change the way we think and live. In simplest terms, to be God inside minded. We have to change our thoughts from God is somewhere out there and I'll come down, rain down, come pour out, pour out. Yes, God does pour out His Spirit. But this may sound strange if you've never thought this way. He pours out of the hearts of His sons and His daughters. He can pour down from heaven. He can pour out from anywhere He wants. But God chooses to work on the earth through His original design. Yeah. That's right. God's sons and daughters. God's a family. Uh, God. God inside minded. God living on the inside. Hallelujah. If we'll go to Romans chapter 8, I'm going to read some exciting uh, scriptures from Romans chapter 8. You know Romans, and you know, I think Romans 8 is just so great for today. We really need to get into it. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. And we'll go through to like um, verse 18. 13 to 18, we'll just work our way through it. For when you live controlled by the flesh, you're about to die. But if the life of the Spirit, that's the Spirit within, puts to death the corrupt ways of the flesh, we then taste His abundant life. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. You know, God doesn't want us to stay babies. We're to stay childlike, but not childish. Just little babies are childish and we've all done childish things uh, in the natural realm. We've done childish things spiritually after getting saved. You know, we've maybe believed some funny things or said funny things in our zeal for God. It's okay. God doesn't get upset and get angry about it. You know, kids are kids. Children are children. It's okay to be a young Christian. That's how you get into the kingdom. Just be happy. Be open-minded. Be humble. You know, don't take yourself so serious. You know, have a good laugh and a good cackle. You know, get drunk on the Spirit of God, have a drink. How do you do that? Just come to the waters. Jesus said, come, it's free. Just drink. Just imagine yourself drinking of the substance of life, the river of life. You know in heaven you can jump into that river, you can breathe beneath the river, you can drink of it, you can splash around in it. Really? Where does that come from? It comes from the heart of God. You know, it's just from the heart of God. It's the Spirit of God. It's the glory of God. It's the living essence of God. We're His children. We're to live by this. From our own spirit and that can well up in it within us jesus said we can come and drink from this river it's the river that comes and springs up to everlasting life out of our heart will flow rivers jesus said of living water this is talking about the baptism you know if you're not filled with the spirit and baptized it's another manifestation the spirit of god will come in and come out and flow out everywhere like streams and rivers and great gushing torrents uh the spirit of god with unknown tongues you know, special prayer language just for you. And just ask to be filled. Your Father will give that to you. The mature children are those who are moved by the impulses. Holy Spirit impulse. Holy Spirit words and promptings. Many times it's just a leading. It's just a knowing which way to go. Why? Because He's down in there. He's down in there. Right down in there where our conscience is. Sometimes you know if you're doing the wrong thing. 
What are you going to do? Keep plowing on? Keep kicking against the pricks? Or are you going to just yield and say, hang on a second, that's, I'm doing the wrong thing. Let's back up a bit and let's go this way. But what stops us? What is it? Why do we kick, kick, kick? Oh, there can be many things. Our human pride, you know. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want someone to think, oh, well, I'm, I've made a mistake. I'm going to have to change my mind. We're just going to plow on. Many have done that. You know, the, top, the, the captain of the Titanic, you know, his conscience must have been bothering him, but he just plowed on, you know. We don't want to plow through life to our own destruction or the destruction of others. Let's be led by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. You did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But there you have it. There's where so much of church world has been, and maybe still is, but that's got to change. You know, religion destroys lives. Christianity is not supposed to be religion. The word religion is bad in itself. It means return to bondage. If Jesus freed us from bondage, why would we want to go back to bondage? Why go back and be bound up? He wants us free from all that bondage, free from never being good enough, rules and regulations. If I can't quite get this right, that means I'm not good enough. Jesus makes us good enough, period. Is this blood enough or not? You know, if you've sinned, you know, join the club. But is your sin so bad that Jesus' blood can't forgive? No. Or is your sin a special one? See, that's, no. that's pride. Or that's unbelief. You know, crucify that unbelief and that pride. Jesus' blood can cleanse the most wretched sinner. You know, Jesus' blood is wonderful and beautiful and perfect. Drink indeed. His, his body that was crucified, torn apart, is bread indeed, where we can gain life. You know, let's not trample the blood of Jesus underfoot. By saying stupid things, well, I've just gone too far, I've just sinned too much, you know. No, don't say things like that. Let's not blaspheme God, let's not blaspheme the blood of Jesus and trample it. Jesus' blood is enough. And if you're honest and thought down on the inside where the Holy Spirit is, you'd have to agree, yes, David. I know it's enough. You know, so don't be proud. I might be getting in your face right now, but, you know, stop it. Take God at His word. Let the forgiveness come in your heart. His blood is enough. Jesus loves you. He loves you with an endless love. His love is higher than the heavens. His love is deeper than the deepest ocean. His love knows no bounds. He's jealous for you with a godly, jealous love. He paid for you with his own blood. His blood is enough. The blood of Jesus Christ. So, we haven't received a spirit of religious duty. We've received the spirit of full acceptance. Hallelujah. And folding us into the family of God. You know, parents shouldn't reject their kids. Good parents don't. God's the best parent. He never rejects a child. He loves his children. He loves his family. We have to get our thinker straightened out. We have to repent of those wrong thoughts and wrong attitudes. And you will never feel orphaned. For as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father or Daddy. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us. As he whispers into our innermost being, You are God's beloved child. You know, the Holy Spirit saying things like this, Leah, you're God's beloved child. You know, brother, and sister, mothers, dads, uncles, aunts, you know, grandparents, grandchildren, whoever it is, whoever you are, orphan. Doesn't matter who you are. Pedophile. Ooh, murderer. It doesn't matter who you are. God's not looking at that. He created you and sent you from heaven. You think, oh well, you know, the world will never love me because I've done this, I've committed this crime, I've done this act, you know, I've taken a life. Don't think too high of yourself. Jesus died for everyone. You and me, everyone on the whole face of the earth. You know, I said those things to shock you to be awake. Jesus' blood is enough. Verse 17, since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. Since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him 
provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. Um, you know, I don't know what all that means, but I know part of what it means. You know, Jesus suffered a lot, didn't he, on the cross? But that's not the suffering so much. He suffers still. You know, he feels our weakness, our pain, our grief. He really understands. Many are going around thinking, well, if I could just have someone understand my situation who I could talk to and relate to, well then, I'd feel better if I could just pull my hat out, but no one understands my situation. That may be true in this world, even though there would be some people, because there's no thing that we haven't all got in common in somewhere, in some nation, somewhere, more than we probably imagine. You know, the whole world suffers similar fates. But there is someone who understands. He lives right inside of you. Uh, see how he feels? The Holy Spirit is in there. He feels the feelings. Jesus feels his weakness. Feels the pain. See, that's he suffers with us and we can partake of that suffering. We can feel for other people. We can pray for them. We can intercede for them. We can take upon his heart and pray and cry to God for uh, that one to be free. Verse 18, last verse, I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled. Where? Within us. See? The glory of God is going to cover the earth, the Bible says, you know, as the waters cover the seas. That's a lot of glory. But where is that glory going to be revealed and made manifest and come from? Within. As I said, God is God. If He chose to do it this way, who are we to argue? God wants to flow out of us with these rivers. As we flow out and join river banks, the, the banks will, will burst and we will flood uh, the earth like rivers that burst their banks in flood times. Uh, we're to be the life and the living rivers for this hurting world. Let's uh, let our light shine. If you make a mistake, run to God. You know, repent daily because we've all missed it somewhere through the day and we've, we're changing, we're growing. Let's not be condemned by it. If we've hurt each other, let's forgive. Let's quickly make up. You don't hold on to grudges. I forgive. Be quick to do that. Be quick to uh, forget. And you can uh, really be one who is, is free. You know, the freedom comes layer by layer. We're transformed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. It's not a one-time event. Although our heart gets changed the moment of the conception of the new birth, our minds are transformed slowly. You know, the rate and speed that that happens uh, depends a lot on us, but it is still grace. We still have to yield. We still have to say, yes, amen, and believe that God living on the inside is coming up within us and not changing our very own nature to be conformed to the image and likeness of uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're not there with you, but uh, can we just send, you know, just our loving greetings from our home? You know, this is David and Leah, Pastor David, my wife, Pastor Leah. You know, we are pastors, but, you know, uh, for eternity, we, we won't be known as your pastor. You we're just people. We're just like you. We're just people. And there's many servants around the world that, um, that, that love you too and pray for you, I'm sure. Think of our children in India, those children in our homes. They're praying for us, you know. They're praying for you. We love you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Lord's Day. God bless you. Be blessed.